I hope you're there in 1 John, and, and this morning is our 20th visit to this book. And John has done a masterful work or masterful job in sharing with us here recently the marks of a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in review last week, we learned of certain motivations, certain truths that will exist in the believer's life if they are going to love with an agapao love that the Bible commands us to love with. Agape love is, is, not a, is not a natural love. It's not a love that we can just cook up in ourselves based on our own free wills. No, it is a supernatural love. Thus, we, we must rely totally on God on the ability to love others as we ought. Now today, John provides us, yes, with more true marks of a true believer, but he really does more than that. This last chapter is a little different from the rest of the book. He finishes this letter uh, as an act of encouragement to the believer, to, to land the plane, if you will, with, a, with an edifying flair. And this morning he, he, he does that in, in one way, and then next week we'll look at the third, second way, and then the third and final way he does that will be found uh, in three weeks, and then we'll have a review of this entire book before we move on to our next series. But it's interesting to know, or interesting to note, that the way John seeks to do that this morning is a very applicable way in which he does it. Let me back up for a second and just speaking of those who are sick this morning. Those who have dealt with hardship uh, this year. You know, it's no question that if you live long enough, life, you discover very quickly that life can be very difficult. You know, the truth is this, either you're going through a valley today, you're just coming out of a valley today, or you're in peacetime about to enter a valley today. Peacetime for the Christian does not last long, especially in this life that we are called to live. The Bible warns us that this world will bring great calamity. That it will bring great persecutions, maybe physical persecution, spiritual persecution, mental persecution. But the reality is, as we walk in pilgrimage through this world, through a world that is depraved and sinful and sin sick and dead in it, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have hardship. We're going to have storms that we must weather, that we must drive through, that we must endure. Yet despite the pain, and despite the storm, and despite the rain, and despite the hardship that, yes, we all are called to weather, the Bible also provides us with a blueprint to overcome every storm. A blueprint to overcome every calamity. Encouragement to not ever lose hope in tomorrow. I'm no fool in saying this. I know some of where you are, some of you where you are in life, and some of you I, I don't know so much about. But the reality is this. Many of you this morning are struggling. Many of those who are joining us on Facebook are having a hard season. Those on YouTube as well. We're not, none of us are immune to this. And some of you right now are in the middle of the valley. And you're fighting. And you're waking up with the blanket of anxiety on you. You're going to bed with the blanket of anxiety on you. You're having dreams about it. And during the course of the day, yes, indeed, it is getting the best of you. It may be a health concern. It may be a relationship problem. It might be a financial burden. It might just be some sort of other mental distraction that is seeking, nipping at your heels of your heart to distract and deter you from living the life that you want to live for the glory of God and finding great joy in that. And you're in the middle of the storm right now. You're on the metaphorical interstate and it is raining hard and you can't quite see 
where you're headed. So how does the Bible teach us to overcome such burdens that we bear? The Bible tells us that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What are some practical things found in our text today that we would be good to remind ourselves to strengthen us in the midst of the fight? To encourage us in the midst of the storm. To edify us in the middle of the valley. Well, I pray today's message will encourage you and it will edify you that as we walk the narrow way, you will find hope always in tomorrow. May the Lord have his way with our hearts this morning as we seek to grow in his word. We're in 1 John this morning, verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5. First John writes, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. Lord, our hearts are heavy this morning. There are so many who are sick among us, who are dealing with struggles and pains and frustrations and sicknesses that are too many to count. Families that are suffering and are mourning the losses of loved ones, even now today. Lord, this message could not be more timely. So, Father, as we seek to honor your word here at this church from this pulpit, I pray that you will give us all tender hearts, tactful minds. Lord, that you would give me the gracious words to say and the grace and mercy to present them well for the glory of your name. I'm but a messenger. Would you use this crooked stick to draw a straight line? Would you give me a focused mind, a focused heart, and the words to say that your church would be edified and built up and encouraged from this passage? May we leave here today glorifying you, for you and you alone are worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With these verses in mind, these truths that exist in these five verses are here to help us compare combat, push back, fight, any setback that we would be willed to face in this life. So how are we to do it? How can we be an overcomer? Romans 8, after all, tells us that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that there is a love that exists that the world can't take away from us. How are we to overcome anything and everything that would seek to tempt us, to distract us, to push us off the narrow path of truly living for the glory of our Father in heaven. Well, here are some markers of an overcomer that I think you and I would be good and benefit from. Number one, number one, overcomers, or to overcome, number one, is to overcome with faith. Overcome with faith. Look at verse one, and then we're going to look at four and five one more time. It says in verse 1, whoever believes, there's the word faith, that's where we get the word faith there. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. Verses 4 and 5, one more time. For whatever is born of, uh, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who, there it is, believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the first edifier, encourager, and motivator of being an overcomer facing anything and everything that this world would throw in our way. This is the base. This is the ground floor. This is the foundation. This miracle of faith. This miracle, this gift of God, the ability to believe in something that we have never seen with our physical eyes. Faith is everything. Without faith, you're sunk. Now the detail of this faith is equally important. The Christian is an overcomer, and the Bible teaches that we are overcomers in this passage based on our faith. 
But the quest, better question is, is what do we have faith in? We are overcomers in this life, in our Christian walk, because we have faith. Yes. But our faith is not put in our own ability to overcome. That's the biggest hindrance in all of us. We're all tempted to be problem solvers of our own issues, of our own situations, of our own circumstances. There are some things, however, in life that by, uh, by the grace of God, we cannot overcome other than if we have faith in the right person. The Christian is an overcomer not because they have faith in themselves, not because they have faith in their spouse, not because they have faith in a pill that the doctor says will solve your issue. Not because we have ultimate faith in a treatment. And not even because we have faith in a bank account that we have worked 30, 40, 50 years to build and prosper in. No, the Christian is an overcomer due to their faith in the one who has overcome, Jesus Christ. That is the only manner in which we can overcome anything and everything that this world can throw at us. Many times we are guilty of not giving credit where true credit is due in the overcoming of said trial or tribulation. But only through Christ may we overcome. This is, Jesus is exclusive in the faith. Jesus is exclusive in saving believing. We know this because the Bible says so. In John chapter 14, verse 6, says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Clear as day. The Bible alone. Solus Christus. Christ alone. We know the five solas here. But you are saved by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. Talk about narrow-mindedness. Talk about politically incorrect. It was politically incorrect in Jesus' day, in John's day, and that is the politically incorrect answer today as well. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Christ, Jesus the Son of God. John chapter 8, verse 24 says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, the Christ, you will die in your sins. Jesus said that. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. This is where saving faith is found. This is where saving faith is laid. This is where saving faith exists. You have the mark of a characteristic of an overcomer if you have saving faith in Christ Jesus alone. The first edifying heading this morning is whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever you're trying to wrangle with, be sure that you believe in Christ Jesus as Lord. And if that is true, Christ Jesus has, over, has already overcome anything and everything that could ever be thrown your way. You're an overcomer in Christ. So, second heading. To believe is to have great overcoming faith. Number two, we are to be overcomers with love. We are to be overcomers with love. What a mark this is. What a, what a common thread this is. All the way through the first, uh, all the way through first John. We're commanded to love, to love, to love, to love, to love. But do you also know that this command to love, displaying this characteristic of love to any trial, any situation, any circumstance, especially when it comes with a disagreement with somebody else, the best way to overcome the disagreement is to love and to express love to the offensive party. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is is, is that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. Overcomers know how to love and how to love well because they know God, and we looked at this last week, the characteristic 
of being a child of God is to display your father. You're going to look like your dad. Whenever you're born again, you're going to reflect your dad, your heavenly father in the spiritual sense. And one of the main characteristics of God is love. As a matter of fact, the first fruit of the spirit is love. Now, not only are we going to reflect that on the day to day and seek to extend that, that people would see us and glorify our Father in heaven in our generalized loving, but one of the best ways you can overcome obstacles, trials, tribulations, setbacks is to choose to apply this love to whatever problem that you're facing. Now, that is countercultural. Because we are raised from a, the beginning. I know I was. If someone hits you, hit them back. <laughs> if someone pushes you, push back. Meet them with the equal force in which they come at you with. But what does the scripture say? What does the text teach? Jesus said if someone asks you for a shirt, give them your coat. Jesus says if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. Jesus says do not repay evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. The, the, the Bible says vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. One of the greatest ways that we can solve conflict in our lives is to choose to love over anything and everything else. Sometimes that love is tough love. But regardless, it's done out of a heart of love. Not out of friction. Not out of fleshly anger. Not out of rebellion. Not with a vengeful spirit or a vengeful heart or a bitter heart. But out of love. And love that goes beyond our emotions. 1 John chapter 2, verse 10 says, The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no causing for stumbling in him. First John 3 14 says we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. First John chapter 3 verse 23 this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and we love one another just as he commanded us. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Beloved, this cannot be preached and applied and studied enough. An overcomer will love, and an overcomer will love well. An overcomer will reflect their father. And either they're a child of wrath or they're, and they will reflect the world or they're a child of God. And they will seek to reflect his love. Let me tell you from personal experience. In dealing with conflicts with brothers and sisters in the faith. When you pray prayers like, Lord, turn my fleshly anger and bitterness and frustration into love from personal experience and just a testimony here he does exactly that and all of a sudden your feelings of anger and bitterness turn to sympathy and love for your brother and sister in the Lord oh how many trials and tribulations and frustrations that can be solved and bombed over if you will metaphorically if we would just choose to love our brother and sister, as God loves us, in salvation, in justification, in our sanctification, and one day in glorification. See what the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. What love this is. And if we would just look at our problems with loving goggles on oh how different some of the things that we may face in this life 
would turn out to be. There's a third heading here that kind of encompasses the first three, but I think we would be good to note it as well. Verses 2 and 3. Verses 2 and 3. Look at verse 2 and 3 of 1 John 5. It says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Overcome with faith, overcome with love, and overcome with obedience. Third heading is overcome with obedience. So you've got this equation. You have a saving faith in Jesus. I'm not good in math, but I can figure this out, okay? You've got your saving faith in Jesus. Then you have the plus. And then you have a love for God and other people. Your love for God will be reflected in others. Don't tell me you love God and hate your brother. First John says you're a liar if that happens. We've spent 20 weeks defining that. Your love for God will be reflected in your love for others. If you have a love for others, that means you're not loving, you don't love God as much as you think you do. The supernatural ability to love other people will filter out from your love of who love is. The characteristic will be put on display. So you've got a faith in Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're born again. You love God and you love, uh, you love others. Therefore, equal signs, your obedience to the word will be insanely obvious. Now, just a few words here I want to define for you so we get these words right. They're, it's very important that we define these words the right way. Verses 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love and observe his commandments. Now, that observe word, I want to define it for you. It's not just reading it and looking at it and say, oh, that's cute, that's nice, that's, that's um, ideal. Now, the word observe there in the Greek means to live out. We live out his commandments. It means to accomplish. We accomplish his commandments in our own lives. We practice his commandments. We flesh out his commandments. We put to work his commandments. Our observation and um, uh, obedience to this word is a reflection for where our faith is and who we're loving. The other word that I want to define here is keep. It says in verse 2, by this we know we love the children of God when we love God and Observe his commandments. We define that word. Okay, verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, you're going to do it rightly. You're going to do it willfully. You're going to do it joyfully. It's not going to be a burden to keep the word of God, but rather that's your motivator. That's your conscience-driven GPS here. You're going to want to do it because it's not a burden to you anymore. If you're not a Christian, the word of God is burdensome. You don't want to read it. You don't want to study it. You don't want to apply it. You don't want to hide his word in your heart because you don't know who he is. If you know who he is and this is your authority in your life, it's not a burdensome thing, but you can't get enough of it. You're walking through a desert and the Bible is the oasis that you just, just lap up the water that you can't get enough of. It's not a burdensome thing to keep the word of the Lord. It's a delightful thing to keep the word of the Lord. But the word keep there is important that we define. In verse 3, the word keep means to watch over, to defend, to guard, to honor, to uphold, to run with. So your observing is more of, okay, I'm, I'm taking this, I'm, I'm putting it into practice, I'm abiding in it, I'm eating it, I'm digesting it. And then you're keeping, in other words, you're deflecting anything else to keep you from observing. It's action on the part of you. And you're doing all of this all centered around the word of God. Around his commandments. Around the commands as to what this word says and what it means. You're not trying to explain it away. You're not trying to um, explain uh, passages that may... Uh, tackle um, the, the, the secular listener the wrong way. No, you're preaching it for what it says. You're preaching it for what it means. You're living it out and you're protecting it at all costs. You're a guardian of truth, regardless of situation or circumstance. We do this because we know that the word of God is inerrant. 
We know the word of God is infallible. We know the word of God is sufficient. We know the word of God is final. We know the word of God is alive. We know the word of God is active. And we know the word of God is the chief authority in all that we are and all that we are to be. And all who have been born of God, saving faith, and all who love God and are loving others as we ought, will keep his word despite the cost, regardless of what might happen to us. Let me tell you, one of the greatest ways you can overcome any obstacle and any frustration and any issue in your life is to truly interpret and digest this book for what it says. When the problem comes, you can say, Jesus told me this was going to happen. Jesus told me I was going to have trouble. And he also gave me great witnesses like Paul who despaired of life. He's been there. He's done that. The word says that he's a high priest that sympathizes with my weakness. He knows what I've been through. He's been tempted in every way yet without sin. Therefore, I'm going to believe this book. I'm going to defend this book. I'm going to rest in this book. I'm going to camp out in this book. I'm going to take this book and I'm going to be sorrowful, yes, with wherever I am, whatever I'm doing. But I'm also going to be rejoicing because I know what this book says. That despite what happens to me, I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119. It's the longest book of the Bible. We do not have time to read that entire chapter, so I won't do that to you. But read it on your own time. But there's a few verses that you would be edified by to remember. Whenever you're going through your valley, your trial, your temptation, you have a saving faith, you're loving God, you're loving other people, and you're seeking to gain perspective and gain encouragement and gain relief from the words of Almighty God. Note how the psalmist writes of the word. It says in Psalm 119, verse 14, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. And just a side note there, I know you all of, um, you can't wa read the newspaper or watch the news without hearing of this mega ball lottery that was just whatever, uh, I don't know the right word to it. It, was, it just commenced and the new drawing was what, $1.28 billion. $1.28 billion cannot buy what this book provides. Do you hear me, church? The psalmist says, I, rejoices, I rejoice in your statutes, your word, your truth. As one who rejoices in great riches, I will go so far to say we are to rejoice in this book more so than all the money in the world. Because his word is true. His word will never pass away. His word is forever and not the dollar bill. Psalm 119.16 says, I shall delight in your statues. I will never forget your word. Psalm 119.24 says, your testimonies are also are my delight. They are my advisors. No one else will do. No self-help will do. No preacher will do. No friendship or spouse will do. This word is it for me. It's going to get me through. They are my chief advisors, these words. Psalm 119.97 says, I love, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day. And Psalm 119.103, How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This book, if you wish to be an overcomer, will be your authority. The word of God convicts and consoles and edifies and directs and saves. And you're totally sunk without it. And all who are truly saved, all who will truly love God and others, will be able to do such things. And those things will be such realities in their life for one reason 
alone is because they have fallen in love with the truths and the words of this book. Your relationship to the divine words of God will set the thermostat of your spiritual life in all that you are and all that you will be. So becoming an overcomer in this life. Let me ask you as I close this morning. Are you an overcomer this morning? Are you an overcomer? I'm not, te- I'm not asking, are you struggling? We all struggle. Everyone struggles. The Lord Jesus Christ needed help to carry his cross to Golgotha. We all have frustration, frustrated season, seasons in our lives. We all have valleys that we are called to pilgrim through. We all have health concerns that we have to address. But I'm asking you, are those situations and circumstances getting the best of you? Or is your faith in your love for others and your obedience to this book getting the best of it? By Christ, through Christ, and in Christ, nothing can separate you from his love. And nothing, nothing, nothing can get the best of you in the Son. You know, in order to truly be an overcomer in this life, remember, it starts with faith. And Romans 10, verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So as we close this morning in the preparation uh, of, of of this invitation, maybe it's maybe the reason why that situation or circumstance or this season, wherever you are, whatever you're facing, is dominating you. Is getting the best of you. Is wreaking havoc on your life. Quite simply because your faith is not where it ought to be. So I have to ask this question, where's your faith this morning? Is it in the spouse? Is it in the pill? Is it in the treatment? Is it in the relationship? Is it in the money? Or is it in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone? I pray if your faith is not a saving faith, which is found in Christ alone, that you would repent of your sins and turn to Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. May we be a church of overcomers. May we, like Paul wrote, when we face the seasons of life that seek to get the best of us, we can say, yeah, we're sorrowful, but we still have great reason to rejoice God's going to get glory from me in this. I know him. I love him. I have reason to love others. I'm going to be obedient to this book. I'm trusting this book for what it says and what it means. It's not going to get the best of me. May we talk like that, Neil Road. May we be God-focused, faith-focused. May we love God and others deeply with this agapao love, despite situation or circumstance. And may our love for the word be resolute. And may these things be for his glory and for your ultimate joy. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together.